I admit that I'm a fan of good movies. Uh, I don't know that I would call myself a movie guy, though, because every one of us has a friend or some friends that are a movie guy or a movie person. You know, the people that can name all the directors and, and name the years and, and name the actors and actresses. I, I can't even, like, name celebrities when I see them, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. But I do appreciate uh, good movies. And, and my favorite kind of movie is a movie with a huge plot twist at the very end. A movie where you something happens that you didn't expect, but then you realize that you should have been expecting it all along. You see all of these clues throughout the movie. And that's one of those movies that you go back and you watch a second time, like, aha, aha, aha. And you try to find inconsistencies, and you don't find them. Uh, I, I think a lot of uh, M. Night Shyamalan movies, for example. Movies like uh, The Sixth Sense. You know, nobody would suspect that what's revealed at the end of that movie. <laughs> I mean, it's 30 years old. You should have seen it by now. But <laughs> no spoiler alert for everyone that's going to run off to Amazon Prime and watch, uh, and, and watch uh, The Sixth Sense. Uh, another M. Night Shyamalan movie that's even better, even more directly faith-related is, is Signs with Mel Gibson. Another good movie. Uh, you realize, oh, all along there are these random things going on, but now they all suddenly make sense. And this is what the resurrection was like, in a sense, or at least how I would imagine it to look for the earliest Christians. We tend to be kind of hard on the apostles and the disciples when we read the accounts of Easter morning because they were surprised. They were surprised at the resurrection. They were surprised about the passion and death of Jesus. And we hear St. Peter say in our first reading today, which comes from the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, which is kind of like, speaking of movies, the Acts of the Apostles is like the Gospel of Luke, part two. It's, it's the continuing story uh, from Luke's gospel. So here's the post-Easter church, the post-Ascension church, and Peter's preaching to the Sanhedrin. He's preaching to the council that condemned Jesus to die, presumably many of the same people still on it. I mean, you want to talk about some, I'll use a Jewish word, some chutzpah, you know. Uh, I know, right? And he's saying, but if you listen to the prophets, you knew that Christ would suffer. Now, the deal with that is, though, if you go back to the scriptures and you look at the prophets, you really have to dig to understand that the Messiah was going to be someone who was going to suffer. Sure, you see allusions, for example, uh, in, the, in the later chapters of Isaiah to this suffering servant that for, for uh, millennia, rabbis were trying to figure out who this suffering servant was. Some thought it was the prophet Jeremiah, for example, because a lot of the prophets suffered. Uh, you certainly see in the book of Daniel this figure called the Son of Man who suffers. So there are some explicit clues, but the rest of it might not be so apparent. And this is why even Jesus himself in the resurrection account says that the law so not just the prophets, but the law, the Torah itself, the first five books of the Bible, pointed to him. And the Psalms pointed to him. You know, uh, we have this beautiful Psalm uh, that we, we had today, Psalm 4, that talks about God relieving us in time of distress. Could the early Jews have seen right away, oh, this is going to be about the Messiah and his resurrection and, and, and the sub? No. You know, one of them that that's becomes obvious but the crucifixion of Jesus is, is because he quotes it himself on the cross, Psalm 22, that speaks about someone who's pierced, someone who's crucified, someone who's suffering greatly. But they didn't make sense until they were kind of explained after the resurrection. And so we see this happening with the two disciples that Jesus meets on the road to Emmaus. He meets up with them. They're walking. They're going to Emmaus. And he says, what are you talking about? And they're like, what the heck is wrong with you? You don't know? Didn't you check your Facebook feed this morning? Everyone's talking about this. It's the talk of the town. 
there's this guy, Jesus, and we were believing in him, and we were his disciples, but now he's dead. And so we don't know what to do. And what does Jesus do? He opens the scriptures, shows to them where in the scriptures it says that the Christ must suffer. And then when they get to where they're going, they celebrate the Eucharist, they break the bread, and Jesus is made known to them, and then, boof, he's gone. So now what we're dealing with is all these accounts that happened on Easter morning into Easter evening. Now, the first lesson that we learn from looking at the early church is the early church did not respond well to the passion and death of Jesus. In fact, when Jesus was captured, you know, in the, in the middle of Passover, in the middle of his Passover supper, he was captured, taken away. What happened to the apostles and the disciples? Pew, 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 you know, they scattered. With some exceptions. Certainly Jesus' mother, Mary, Mary Magdalene hung around. We know that St. John hung around. Maybe there's some others that hung around too. We really don't know. But most of them hid. Peter denied Jesus. And so we see that the church has kind of fallen apart. It seems disintegrated. Everyone's off doing their own thing. Now, I think it's important for us to hear now the whole point of this is what the resurrection did for the early church and what the resurrection can and should do for us today. So now here we are, Easter, and all of a sudden there's these random Jesus sightings everywhere. You know, first it begins with the women who go to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. The stone is rolled away. It doesn't even mention where the guards went. They probably got out of town when there was an earthquake and an angel rolls away the stone of the tomb. I, I, I think I probably would have run at that point as well. But they go to anoint the body of Jesus and he's not there. And then at some point after that, Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, reveals that he's risen, says, go and, and tell my brethren. Go to Peter, go to the 11. Go to Simon, go to the 11. She does that. Peter and John race to the tomb. John gets there first, which we all know because he's the one that wrote the gospel. He wanted to remind Peter of that for the rest of his days. He gets to the tomb first, waits for Peter. They look inside. The tomb is empty. At some point, we know from other, other accounts that at some point that morning or after this point, Jesus appeared to Peter. And who knows who else? So they start to hear all of these accounts. And then there's these two guys that are walking. We know one of them, his name is Cleopas. The other one, we don't know who it is. Some of the church fathers suspected that it may have been St. Luke himself, since this is only accounted for in his gospel. But that's just speculation. They're walking, and this is the whole story that I just recounted, the story of the road to Emmaus. So now all of the apostles' disciples are gathered together in the upper room, presumably, and sharing the story of these Jesus sightings that they've had. Happened here, happened here, happened here. And now these two other guys bust through the door and say, we've seen the Lord. He was revealed to us when we celebrated the Eucharist. He was revealed to us in the breaking of the bread. And so now they're all even more excited or maybe even more confused, sharing all their stories. And then what happens? Bam. Jesus appears to all of them. What happened is the passion, the events of the death of Jesus scattered the church, sadly. Fragment of the church caused divisions and fear and doubts and discouragement in the life of believers. Many of them, I imagine, were also struggling with acknowledging their own faults and failures their own sinfulness. I mean, he told us this was going to happen and we still didn't believe him? What's wrong with us? How can the Lord ever forgive me for abandoning him, for denying him? Or they were scared for their own lives, not knowing what was going to happen. They put Jesus to death. Am I next? What's going to happen here? But now as the resurrection accounts start to happen, 
the church is coming back together. The church is banding together as one body of believers, not just individuals with experiences, but a body of Christ united as witnesses of his resurrection. There in the place, presumably, uh, the upper room, the cynical, the very place where he had celebrated the Last Supper with them, perhaps doing exactly what they did, celebrating the Eucharist. And then what happens? Bam! Jesus appears to them. St. Mark, or excuse me, St. Luke was a physician by trade. So you see he gives kind of physiological details that we not, might not always get. He's, uh, because sometimes people say, you see, this is how people like this talk, you know. You see, what the resurrection really was is it was the rising of Jesus in the hearts of human beings. And when the church got together and did Eucharist, because people would talk like this also, don't use definite articles. When the church gathers and use, does Eucharist, they remember Jesus, and that was the resurrection. Isn't that cute? That's nonsense. Would you go to the grave for that? Because I wouldn't. Instead, what is Jesus? Jesus appears to them and says, look at my hands. Look at my feet. A ghost does not have flesh and bones. We know that because Patrick Swayze showed it to us. <laughs> but to go one step further, what does Jesus do? He eats in front of them. This is to show that the resurrection was a reality. Now, I want you to remember something about the apostles. These men, by their nature, it seems, were cowardly. The moment the passion of Jesus began, they scattered, they ran, and they hid. But now that they have seen the glory of the risen Christ, they take that to their grave. They died for it. And this is why I believe the resurrection is one of the most attested to historical events. Period. There's more written attestation to the existence and resurrection of Jesus than there is to the existence of Julius Caesar. In terms of eyewitness account and historical accuracy. Now some might say, well Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. This is something that his followers made up, maybe even a century later. Okay, let's just play games and entertain that for a second. Y'all ready? What did they gain from it? What did they gain from it? I can tell you what they gained from it. They were beaten, martyred, nailed to crosses, decapitated, had their skin peeled off, boiled in oil, and fed to lions. Every one of the apostles, except for John, died as a martyr, and many more of the disciples. And these are people who already showed that they weren't the kind of people that were going to die for a lie. They weren't seeking that kind of attention. In fact, they kind of fled from it. But now, the resurrection of Jesus made them witnesses to the truth. Allowed them to stand face to face with their own fears, their own insecurities, their own sins, their own mistakes and realize that those things don't have say over them. Those things do not define them. They realize that they would probably be called crazy by many people in the world and they no longer cared what the world thought because they had seen the power and glory of the risen Lord. So what did the resurrection do for the early church? The first thing it did is it brought the believers back together as one body celebrating one Eucharist. The same as it does for us now as we partake of his precious body and blood, soul and divinity, as we celebrate this mass, we see the risen Lord. We partake of his body and his blood. It also gave them courage to carry on and to be bold witnesses despite the thoughts of other human beings, despite their own inadequacies, 
inadequacies, despite whatever trial, trials, hardships, or burdens they were encountering in their own lives. A beautiful reminder to us that not only as we deal with a church, brothers and sisters, that may seem fragmented and a bit scattered right now in this era of confusion, but also to people who are going through, people who are human beings going through struggles, doubts, fears, insecurities, mental afflictions, disease, sickness, death, and loss of loved ones. That the resurrection of Jesus Christ tells us that none of those things ever have the final say because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Jesus Christ has been revealed to his church in glory. And the message of Jesus there in the upper room on that day was not just to behold the glory of his resurrection, which in and of itself is something miraculous and amazing but it was to behold the glory of his resurrection and to go out and be his witnesses. What does he end with here? You are the witnesses of these things. And here we are, my brothers and sisters, just as that early infant church was 2,000 years ago, gathered together as one body of believers throughout the world, celebrating the one Eucharist that the Lord has given us by which we partake of his body, his blood, his soul, and divinity. And we have an opportunity right now to behold the power and the glory of the risen Lord and to see what that means for us. As we behold the risen Lord today, we are challenged to be reminded that his glory far surpasses any darkness that this world brings and that it unites us all under the banner of glory, under the banner of his resurrection. And it challenges us not to keep the resurrection a secret, but to proclaim the power and glory of Jesus Christ, our Savior, throughout Naples, throughout Southwest Florida, and unto the ends of the earth.